I see a whole lot of confusion on the internet surrounding the Gorgon Medusa from classical mythology, regarding her personal background and what her story is meant to represent. Now, most people understand that myths were originally transmitted through oral tradition, and therefore there's no definitive version of any given story or character. Mythology evolves and branches off with each generation, and that process continues to this day. I'll be honest though, it kind of bugs me how uncritical most people are when they encounter a variant of a myth that they're unfamiliar with or that contradicts the one they know. More often than not, they simply shrug off their confusion by saying, huh, I guess that's just a different version of the story. But that could mean a whole lot of different things depending on what cultural context a myth variant originated in. With classical mythology, that could be anywhere from archaic Greece to the Roman Empire. And beyond those periods, people have continued to iterate, revise, and spin off classical mythology into the modern day. Distinguishing the time and place a variant came from matters because that knowledge affects how we view the real people who lived there. So, in explaining Medusa, I want to carefully track her evolution over the years step by step. The oldest traces of the Gorgon appear in prehistoric Aegean art, and when I say old, I mean old. The earliest Gorgonian, that is a depiction of a Gorgon's face without a body, is a ceramic mask found in Thessaly which dates back to sometime between 5800 to 5300 BC, several millennia before any of our classical mythological sources. This visage, as adorable as it is, might not remind you too strongly of Medusa, but its defining traits bulging eyes, flaring nostrils, and a wide open mouth belong to a pattern seen throughout prehistoric Aegean artwork leading up to the Archaic Gorgon. This is the type of Gorgon we see in the Greek Archaic period, a woman with a wide face sporting almost comically grotesque features including a beard, tusks, a lolling tongue, as well as snakes in her hair and wings. The Gorgonian is probably the most striking image seen all throughout Archaic Greek artwork. Unlike most characters whose faces are shown in side profile, the Gorgon is looking straight forward, seemingly staring through the fourth wall at the viewer. It was believed that its intense gaze warded off evil, so Gorgonia appear all over the place on architecture, pottery, coins, shields, amulets, and other common items. My personal favorite are the bulls with faces at the bottom, so when you finish your meal you get a spooky surprise. Side note, surprisingly the words Gorgon and Gargoyle do not have a shared etymology, even though they sound similar and basically serve the same function. I just thought that was neat and worth mentioning. Now in order to understand the Gorgons as characters, we need to look to literature. But but first, I gotta tell you about today's sponsor. I've always been looking for a good way to get quality audio on the go. And my old setup of taping two studio monitors to my head connected to an amplifier and a car battery for power just wasn't cutting it. So I was super happy to learn about this video's sponsor, Raycon, who makes quality wireless earbuds at half the price of other premium brands. With Raycon's everyday earbuds, I can satisfy my ever-dwindling Gen Z attention span by listening to music, audiobooks, and podcasts while doing things like cooking and doing doing chores around the house. And with their passive noise isolation feature, I don't need to worry about outside sounds breaking my immersion. My favorite thing about the everyday earbuds though is that they have physical clicky buttons on them. I previously used earbuds from Competitor Audio Brand, which had capacitive touch sensors, which sucked because any light accidental touch will trigger them and pause or fast forward whatever you're listening to. With Raycons, you never accidentally press them. It sounds like a little thing, but it's so much better. And you can find a pair of Raycons perfectly suited for your needs, whether that's the everydays, the fitness earbuds, or the low latency gaming headphones. All of them coming at a fraction of their competitors' costs. Ready to buy something small with a big impact? Wow, that's really what the copy says, okay. Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash jakew to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Thanks for supporting this channel, Raycon. Anyway, regarding the mythology of the Gorgons in Archaic Greece, in Hesiod's Theogony, the sea gods Phorcus and Ceto are the parents of the three sisters, Stino, Euryale, and Medusa, the latter of whom was mortal, unlike her deathless sisters. Hesiod also says that Medusa had sex with the god Poseidon, quote, in a soft meadow among spring flowers. This imagery may strike you as surprisingly romantic. As far as we can tell, this was a mutually consensual affair. It's important to keep in mind, however, that this is Hesiod, aka the women are the source of all human suffering guy telling the story. As is unfortunately often the case with the many sexual affairs of Greek mythology, we can't be entirely entirely certain whether or not the woman was a willing participant, because the male writer probably didn't consider that an important enough detail to clarify. Regardless, from Poseidon, Medusa conceives the winged horse Pegasus and the less well-known winged boar Chrysaor, who are birthed from her neck after she's decapitated by the hero Perseus. Homer, meanwhile, describes his version of the Gorgon as a bodiless monster from Hades whose face is brandished on the Aegis, a shield or goatskin garment used by Zeus and Athena to incite fear in their enemies. Homer 
also mentions Perseus, but never anything about his quest to retrieve Medusa's head, so it's possible that this story never reached him. It's generally thought that Homer lived slightly before Hesiod, but there's no hard evidence for when exactly either of them were born. They both probably lived sometime in the 8th century BC, and may very well have been contemporaries. As for where they lived, Homer is believed to be from the island of Ionia, close to modern-day Turkey, while Hesiod was from Boeotia in mainland Greece, so based on their distance from each other, you can see how they could have been working with considerably different mythological traditions. Another side note, I surprisingly had trouble finding references from this era to the idea that looking at a Gorgon's face turns you to stone. There's a recurring notion that the Gorgon's gaze could incite terror or even strike you dead, and some of the earliest art of Perseus shows him turning his head away while decapitating Medusa, so he clearly had reason to avoid making eye contact with her, but specifically regarding petrification, the earliest quotation I could find was from Pindar in the 5th century BC, describing how Perseus brought Medusa's head wreathed in its serpent locks to strike stony death on the islanders. I'm not super clear whether that was an intentional pun or just a fancy choice of words that were later taken literally, but by at least the 3rd century BC we start to see explicit references to the Gorgon's petrification powers. Anyway, so the archaic Gorgon is unambiguously a monster, but that perception started to change as the years went on. As we move into the classical period, we see a greater and greater emphasis on idealized representations of the human body in art, and not even fearsome monsters could escape this broad stylistic shift. Think about every fantasy setting you've seen where male orcs look like Dave Batista if he ate another Dave Batista. meanwhile the female orcs are Victoria's Secret models with underbites. Turns out that's nothing new. The classical period Gorgon, which became the dominant representation through the rest of antiquity, takes on a more ideally feminine form, with all her typical grotesque features stripped away, leaving a conventionally pretty woman with just snake hair and maybe wings. This style of Gorgon also comes off as notably more passive. Depictions of Perseus and Medusa have him attacking her in her sleep, and many Gorgonia are now looking bashfully off to the side as opposed to giving a more assertive front-facing stare. This shift gave rise to a much more sympathetic take on Medusa's story, first seen in Ovid's Metamorphosis. In Ovid's version, Medusa was originally a human woman with beautiful hair, but after being assaulted by the god Neptune in Minerva's temple, the goddess punished her by turning her hair into snakes. Though this new backstory seems to be entirely an invention of Ovid's as a work of fiction, it's since been incorporated into the broader Medusa mythos. So while Medusa originated as a monster meant to instill fear, as her story evolved, it became impossible for us now to view her as anything but a tragic victim. She was an innocent woman who was assaulted by a man, unjustly punished for it by another woman, and then killed in her sleep by some random guy. It's no surprise then that Medusa's story resonated strongly with members of the second wave feminist movement, and the Gorgonian once again became used as a protective symbol, now specifically for women, her grotesque visage representing rage against the injustice she suffered. And at some point after Medusa's adoption as a feminist symbol, a new interpretation emerged of Ovid's backstory, where Minerva transformed her not as a twisted form of victim-blaming punishment, but rather as a gift. With the ability to turn men to stone, Medusa would be safe from unwanted lust. But tragically, this newfound strength only turned her into a target for Perseus, who killed her to take the power for himself. I don't actually know where this particular modern revision came from, as far as I can tell it's been circulating on the internet for the past several years. If anyone knows who first introduced it, let me know in the comments. Medusa is a perfect example of how mythology continuously evolves even to this day, and each addition to her story makes her a more and more interesting character. However, I think we should be careful not to be so fixated on her most recent iteration that we lose sight of her rich history. Each iteration of Medusa is a reflection of the people who helped form her, from proto-red pill incel Hesiod to 20th century feminist writer Alana de- uh, I don't know if I can say her name on YouTube.